I am based at the MIT Media Lab and I run an initiative called Learning Over Education. And it's a somewhat controversial title and so I want to get it out of the way before people start interpreting it in, in the way it's not intended. Um, my mother was a teacher and I, I'm a huge fan of educators and of teachers. Uh, but sometimes today education can feel like it's something that's being done to you and learning is really at its core something you do for yourself. And so we're trying to shift the conversation a little bit in the direction of learning as we're thinking about uh, the impact of new technologies. Um, I want to ask one question before I jump to the first slide. H how many of you remember when Netscape 1.0 was released in 1994? Yeah. So Okay, so it's a, few, it's a few hands, maybe a quarter of the audience. Um, and it's important to remind ourselves sometimes, so you are, you know, the, or we are kind of the, the last, we're clinging onto the digital natives, right? Like we, we just made it into a world where most of our, or much of our adult life, we've had the internet in some form or other, so we could imagine its effect. But the, what's amazing is now, if you go and speak at other venues, everyone in the audience will not remember the time before the internet. And for us to be kind of at this cusp where we remember the past and the institutions of the past, and also we can start imagining the future, it's a really interesting space, I think. And it's hard to keep up with the ones, like my students, for example, who have never, who cannot remember not having the ability to type questions into Google or going to Wikipedia. Their entire lives have been digital and they take a lot of things for granted that uh, you or I may be skeptical about or a little nervous about or we may not be so happy about, but there is kind of this wave that's coming and, and I think it's important that all of us who have been thinking about these things um, get, it, get involved. And so here's how, how I got involved. Um, I um, when the internet kind of started, you know, it's, it's kind of scary that, so Netscape came out, came out tw almost 20 years ago, which means I've been doing this for a very long time, which worries me a little bit. But as I got, got interested in these communities like Wikipedia and open source software, where people would collaborate with each other online, um, I started realizing that uh, there, was, there was something interesting that was shifting. And, and, and that is that talent is distributed equally across the world. There are as many smart and motivated people in Sub-Saharan Africa as there are in North America or Europe, but opportunity is not. And so for many years, my personal interest in this space has been to change this, to increase opportunities. And the two tools that I like to use are technology and learning. I think learning is a good path towards a better future and I think technology can make learning more accessible and, and create that path for more people. And just as background, this is the kind of real-time Wikipedia editing. Uh, not right now, because I, I recorded this, but um, this is kind of what happens in Wikipedia at any moment. Um, and so in order to do this, one of the things I did was I co-founded an organization called Peer-to-Peer -Peer University, which had a a little bit of a crazy idea and that idea was that if you were interested in any topic and you would find other people interested in the same topic, you could connect with each other online and learn it and you didn't have to wait for an expert to teach it to you. You didn't have to go to a university and enroll at, in, in a degree program. On this, in this new world, you could just go out and learn anything you wanted. And I'm still as excited by this possibility but also I've been doing this for long enough that I, I've realized it's not that easy. <laughs> so the organization Peer-to-Peer -peer University has kind of evolved over many years and now uh, spends a lot of its time co-designing learning communities, which is the, the topic of the um, talk today and the, the conversation. And so with this background, if you ask someone to speak about the core question, are open social learning communities the future of education, then of course the answer is going to be, my answer is going to be yes, because that's what I've been doing for 10 years uh, and maybe longer. And I'm going to try to explain why I believe this in the next 35 or 40 minutes. Um, and there are interesting pieces in this question, right? So 
I, I want to talk a little bit about learning and education because I think there is a difference there and I think it's important as we think about the impact of technology that we have a clear understanding um, of what we want to achieve through learning. And the answers may be very different for all of us, but I think uh, often we jump into the conversation before we stop and we think about what, what do we really want to achieve with learning, what do we think is the role of the university. And then secondly, there are lots of predictions about the future, uh, often technology, uh, but, but some other ideas as well. And so I want to talk a little bit about what, what that means and what other people are saying about the future. And then I want to spend um, some time talking about examples for uh, social learning communities online that are coming out of my work at the MIT Media Lab that we are involved in and, and, and that we're learning um, through. And so if we talk about the future, I think it might make sense to also talk about the past a little bit. So where, do, where does this come from? Uh, and uh, the, the origins of the University of Bologna go back to 1088, um, which is almost a thousand years now with the rounding error. And um, that's a really incredibly long time if you think about companies that were around then that are still around. They're really o only very few. They, they're generally either breweries or restaurants or hotels. Um, there's a great list on Wikipedia, but for the university to have been around for such a long time is an incredible both achievement, but also it says that it plays a very important role in our society and has played through all these dramatic changes um, over a thousand years. Um, and what's maybe even more surprising is that some parts of it still look very similar. So this is a painting uh, about the University of Bologna in uh, the 14th century. And kind of like here, you have someone who thinks he's an expert <laughs> standing on the stage uh, reading from a book. So we don't need books anymore uh, because everyone has phones and everyone can have books. But at the time, books content was a big problem. And then you have a bunch of students uh, who are you know, listening or talking to each other. And, and at least one student is also sitting in the corner and sleeping. Um, and you don't know if he's just bored by the talk or maybe uh, his football club won yeah, last night and he went out and he drank too many Moritz and he's a little hungover, but uh, right, so this is um, kind of what uh, learning in the 14th century looked like and uh, in a way the, the past, right, these 600, 700 years, it's kind of also the present still of education. A lot of education still looks that way and, and also when we think about education, our mind immediately goes to that image, right? So when, when we try to imagine education, we Im immediately go to this image of sitting passively, listening, trying to stay awake, and, you know, it's really hard. And so this is, I think, a good moment to ask ourselves, what is the difference between education and, and learning? And are the two the same sometimes, or how are they related? Because we often use them interchangeably, and yet we know a lot more about learning today than we did in the 14th century. So here's a, an interesting slide uh, that comes out of the work of my colleague Ros Picard at the MIT Media Lab. She put, a, put a, a wristband on one of her students and made him wear it for one week, and he had to record in a diary what he was doing at the different times in the week. And so some things are, actually they told me there's a little, yeah, so some things are not surprising, right? Like, you know, when, when the student is studying, you know, the, there's a lot of, oh, I should explain. The, the graph shows electrodermal activity, which is the, the current that you can detect on your skin, and it's an indicator for engagement. It can be physical engagement, physical activity, or it can be mental activity. Um, and so it's a rough indicator for engagement. And so sometimes, you know, sometimes of the week, you would expect that when the student is studying and working on problems that, you know, they're engaged. When you look at sleep, you would expect it to look like this, where you fall asleep, your REM goes up, and then maybe you have a few slow wave uh, sleep phases throughout. And when they work in the lab, right, and they're applying their work, they should be very engaged. Now, what's a little uh, uh, disconcerting is that the of all those activities that the student did during the week, <laughs> their engagement, I'm glad that wasn't mine, um, their engagement um, that is the lowest 
when they're sitting in class. Right? So it's lower than when they're sleeping, obviously. It's also lower, at least in some cases, when they're watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's lower than when they're relaxing. Um, and you, you may say, well, uh, you know, it's just MIT, so they have really bad professors <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, that would be a good, uh, a valid hypothesis. Um, but I think that uh, probably this is true for many students in many universities. And we happen to know now that we have these devices and we know a lot more about how learning works, that lectures are actually a terrible way to learn. And it's going to be really difficult for all of you to listen to me for 35 or 40 minutes without falling asleep or letting your mind wander. And so I, I have full empathy for that. Um, so, but when we're thinking about the future of learning and the future of education, we kind of want to know, you know, if lectures are not how students learn, then how, how do they learn? And so I decided to um, ask some people who are supposedly experts, which are the students. Uh, and I looked at some of the research, and there's a, I mean, a huge body of research, a lot of it coming out of the Open University of Catalonia. Um, but also it's useful sometimes to just ask people very simple questions. And so I interviewed uh, people from a whole range of backgrounds at MIT students, uh, people who had graduated, people who had dropped out and never graduated, uh, administrators, professors, admissions officers. And I asked them about the learning experience at MIT. And the students I asked, what was something in your uh, MIT history that you would say was a really important learning uh, experience? What was something that happened at MIT that changed the course of your life or where you learned a skill that you're still applying today or where you had a new idea that just blew your mind and afterwards you, you chose a different career, for example. And um, so I want to tell us one of the stories. I heard many, many stories, uh, uh, many amazing stories. Uh, I heard almost no stories about lectures, <laughs> not surprisingly. But uh, um, I heard many amazing stories about the experiences. And I think those stories exist at every university. I don't think that they are unique to MIT. Uh, the stories are different everywhere. But if you, you ask your students uh, about the real learning that happens, a lot of surprising things will come out. And so here's one of the stories that really surprised me and delighted me in a way. Um, if you look at this building, this is the dome of MIT. It's one of the most famous buildings on the campus. And uh, as you can see here, people love to take pictures of it. You know, it's a grand building. And also this is where the graduation ceremony happens. So every year when the, the students graduate, there are hundreds of students here and there are speeches and it's very... So this is a very important building uh, at MIT. And one morning in 2006, MIT woke up and it looked at the dome and there was a fire truck on top of the dome. And I mean, you saw the picture before, this is a very high building and this is a very big fire truck. And um, it, it definitely wasn't there on September 10th, 2006. And so the, how I found out about the story is I spoke to the person who was responsible for this. And she graduated from MIT and went on to get a PhD in science and then went on to become a, a successful scientist managing a team of other scientists. And when I asked her about what was the most important learning experience, she said, without a doubt, the experience where I learned the most and that I'm most proud of in my entire academic history is putting the fire truck on top of the MIT dome. And, and so that's surprising. Uh, you know, if MIT is a very expensive university. If you had to pay for it, uh, you know, you can pay $200,000 for your degree. And uh, putting the fire truck <laughs> on top of the dome is not included in the 200,000, by the way. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I asked her about the, the, the process and, and I realized um, it's not so surprising that she singled this out because it, this was a six month project where she managed a team of 40 engineers and scientists 
and they had to prepare for uh, a an operation that would happen in one night to get this. There was no room for error. They had to get this whole thing on top of the dome, get it installed, make sure it's safe, it doesn't fall down. And they left instructions for how to take it apart as well so that other people can safely take it apart and take it down, which I think is, is really great. Um, so, you know, in a way, if you think about great learning, a lot of the aspects of good learning experiences, you can find them in this example. Um, and I'll just show you one more, uh, and, and I should say there's a history of these projects at MIT, and they're called hacks. Uh, at MIT, hacking is not hacking with computers, it's, it's finding kind of playful solutions and to, to systems. And so I, I really love this one. Um, it's where students built a Tetris game onto the windows of the highest building on the campus, and then you could stand downstairs at the control and you could play Tetris on the, on the building. Um, but this is an aside. <laughs> so, but coming back to this idea of learning, right, in this example of putting the fire truck on top of the building, there are a lot of components that, or aspects uh, that you could uh, pick out and you would say, that's a great learning experience. And that's what we've been doing at the Media Lab. We've been trying to articulate a framework for learning that we implement every day at the Media Lab. So this is a picture of the MIT Media Lab where I work. And most of it looks like this. It's double story, it's different research groups doing very different things. There are 26 different research groups who work on totally unrelated things. Uh, we have 150 students and about 150 researchers and faculty. Um, it's an interesting place because it brings together very diverse backgrounds and, and people who are all very passionate about what they do. But so we, this framework of learning is something that we practice and we observe every day at the Media Lab in, in the way we work with our students. But it's also something we've been thinking about as a way to design technologies for learning, to design workshops for learning, to design institutions, new institutions for learning. What are our design principles for this? And so we've come up with four principles, and we call them the four P's of creative learning. And you will find these, well maybe we'll do this together, they relate to the fire truck. So the first P is P for projects, because when you um, build something or you create something, and creating can be a poem or a novel, it doesn't have to be an engineering project, uh, a lot of the things that you had assumed before, theoretically, turn out to be not true. You run into a lot of difficulties, and there's a lot of learning that happens when you actually create the project. So you could learn about poetry for many years, but when you write poetry, it's a very different activity. There, there are certain aspects of poetry that you can learn from, from doing it that you wouldn't be able to learn from just reading about it. And so a lot of, a lot of work at the Media Lab is engineering and, and technology. So you know we have a lot of projects that look like this, um, and the nice thing about projects is also you can show them to other people. So you can say, hey, I've done this thing, right? I don't have to do a test. Look at my solar car, it drives. Uh, or look at my poem, and it's beautiful. And, um, and then you can share it with other people. And that's actually the second P, is peers. And so a lot of the work at the Media Lab works in collaborative groups. And, and one of the reasons uh, uh, in the interviews I heard one person say, well, everything is peer learning because nobody is smart enough to get through MIT by themselves. Uh, and I think in some institutions that's true. Uh, at Harvard, for example, they did a study about success of Harvard students because they were interested in what makes Harvard students do well and what makes other Harvard students not succeed. Um, and at, at Harvard and MIT, this is a real concern because, on one hand, it's extremely expensive. So for a student to come in, spend a year or two, spending a lot of money, and then dropping out, it's both a financial disaster for them, it's a human disaster for them because they feel like they failed. So finding ways to support them is really important. Harvard did a big study where they asked all of their students uh, questions about what they're doing and how they're succeeding. It's called the Harvard Assessment Study. And the number one indicator for success was the ability to join or form study groups. So it wasn't how many courses you were taking, it wasn't if you were taking big courses or small courses, um, it wasn't all the other things you would have expected to hear. 
the number one most important thing was, can you find other people that help you and that you, would, you can help them when they need help? Because the nice thing about peer learning is also, well, even when you're trying to learn something, the moment someone asks you a question and you explain it to them, uh, you, it turns out you actually learn the things in a much deeper way. And I think probably everyone has experienced this. If, if you get asked a question about something that you think you know very well, and it's a surprising question, it changes your whole, you, you kind of have to go back and, and check that you really understand this thing. So the third P is passion. And passion is, um, essentially means that if you are really interested in something, if it connects to your personal interests, you will work much harder and you will go much deeper than if I'm telling you that you should learn something. So we try to en enable all of our students to find things that they are passionate about, pick technologies that they are excited about, uh, choose uh, projects that they think can change the world, and, and find that those things that, that really grabs their attention, and then we, we try to support them. But finding ways to attach learning to the things that people are already interested in, I think, is really important, rather than the other way around, where first you have to learn all of the background about everything, and then you're allowed to, to start doing things. So passion is really important. And then the last one is play. And play and passion are easy to misunderstand. So for some people, I'll go back to passion. For some people, call it purpose. If passion sounds too hippie or too soft, think about this as purpose, right? Like there should be a purpose to your learning. And play, by play, we don't mean playing around, but we mean taking risks, experimenting, not being afraid to fail, right? Like the idea was that in kindergarten we play, and uh, at least until very recently, you couldn't fail at kindergarten. And actually, ironically, the director of the Media Lab, <laughs> Joey Ito, uh, he, um, he's a college dropout. He never finished his college degree, and he got kicked out of kindergarten. So we used, to <laughs> we used to have this great example where we would say, you couldn't fail at kindergarten until Joey took over the Media Lab, and now <laughs> we realized you can get kicked out of kindergarten. Um, <laughs> but generally, generally, right, learning should be an experience where you are taking risks because, um, and this is actually another quote from Joey, he says, no one has ever won the Nobel Prize for following the rules. And it's true. Uh, if you just follow the rules, you know, you, you can learn a lot and you can be very successful, but for real learning to happen, you have to feel that you're allowed to break the rules. Um, and so I'll come back to all of these things, and, and actually I didn't do this, but the fire truck example, you will find all of these four Ps very strongly represented in that experience. Um, so let me say a, a couple of words about future. And future, uh, the future of education is a big topic right now. If you Google future of education, there will be, probably there's another event about the future of education right now somewhere else in the world. And everyone has an opinion on it. And often those opinions are related to technology, right? So um, there's a new technology and people go, oh, new technology, the future of education, everything is going to change um, and everyone will have access, it'll be cheaper, more efficient, it'll be better. And most times um, that doesn't happen. There are some technologies where it does happen. The book, for example, is a technology that fundamentally changed a lot of things. But many technologies, uh, just some examples in the last hundred years, radio, television, massive open online courses, haven't fundamentally changed the way things are because they've been used to perpetuate the old models. When a new technology comes, the easiest thing to do is you take the new technology, but you apply it to what you already know. So many of the new kind of set of courses, you know, they kind of look like 14th century Bologna, except that, you know, we have a, a bunch of experts in this case, and they don't have a book, but they come through uh, through a video, you know. But it's still kind of one directional. The video, and and then you have a bunch of students, and they're watching the video, right? They're still listening passively, and actually, this is a much bigger problem now because first of all, we can't see them anymore when they're sleeping, and there are many, many more who are dropping out, right? Who are trying to take these online courses and they're not succeeding. And, and yet, we don't know why they're not succeeding. We don't know that they're not succeeding. It's really hard to learn something about the people who are not uh, benefiting. So 
I'm a huge fan of technology, but technology, it's not the, the problem or the opportunity is not the technology, it's how it's being applied. And I briefly want to mention kind of the, the core technology that I think all of my work evolves around and which I think is a uh, paradigm changing technology, kind of like the book was, and that's the, um, the internet. And this is a beautiful illustration of the internet that's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And the interesting thing about the internet is that a lot of design principles were baked into the architecture of the internet that are perfect for learning. So the internet as a designed network was open. Anyone could connect to it. All you needed was a cable and a computer and you could connect into the internet. It's gotten a little more complicated these days, but fundamentally on a technology level, that's still the case. Um, it lets anyone contribute, right? So it doesn't matter which of those nodes you are. It's not like radio or TV where there's one big player in the middle and they push all the content out to everyone. It's really everyone can speak and listen at the same time. And there's a, a peer-to-peer -peer, um, ethos that uh, you can see in the architecture of the technology that, that then permeates the, co the communities that people build on the internet that is very different from a top-down model where you're waiting for permission. You don't have to wait for permission on the internet. And then it, for people who are curious, I, and, and I, I assume many of you are, it's just the ultimate discovery playground. Right? There is, you could spend your entire life just being on the internet, finding new people to talk to, finding new content, new ideas, doing new things. So the one thing that, that I think we often do when we think about what this is, we think of this as computers, right? So there are millions of computers and they're connected by cables. But what I think of when I see this is the people in front of the computers. And that's when I think the technology becomes a paradigm changer. If it's just about connecting computers, it's less interesting. If it's a, about connecting millions of people who could be learning with each other, I think this changes almost everything. And I just want to say one more thing about technology design, uh, using the Media Lab as my, um, my thinking aid. So this is a picture of the Media Lab from the outside. And it has three principles for, for success in everything that it does. And we build a lot of technology. And those three principles are uniqueness. So if someone else is doing this already, we, we try to do something else. It's impact. So it's not enough to just have an idea. It has to change the world or someone's life in some way. It could be many people. It could be a few people in a really deep, meaningful way. And then the last one is my favorite one. It's magic. And we, those are the three official success criteria of the Media Lab. And people often ask, ask me <laughs> or ask magic. How do you define magic? And it's a little bit like a learning or at least some aspects of learning, like curiosity. It's like, you don't really, you can't really define it in a, in a rubric or in a table, but when you experience it, you know it's happening. So, you know, when we see something that's magical, we're all enchanted. It puts a smile on our face. When we have a new idea, an epiphany, we know what that feeling feels like. We know that we can never go back. And so there's something that we can't measure yet today that is really important about technology and about learning. And um, I, my personal opinion is we shouldn't even try to measure it right now because it's, it, sometimes it can be dangerous. Um, so summing up, technology can be the opportunity, can be the problem, but it's really about how you use it. Another one that I'll just briefly mention, and also because my two examples come back to this, is educators. So I think teachers and educators are absolutely crucial for the future of education. Now, I don't think they're the only solution. And I think there are some problems. As I said, my mom was a, was a teacher, and I, I, I actually was a student once in her class, so I, I think she, she was very strict with me, but I thought she was a pretty good teacher. Um, and, you know, I've had some very good teachers in my life, but I've also had a lot of teachers who were kind of okay, and I've also had a few teachers who were really terrible. And so I don't want to put all of my faith into teachers. I think that's too much. But teachers are, at least uh, in the US, totally underappreciated. Uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement, building the future uh, of education, uh, just helping teachers. 
Um, so I want to give two examples, two examples for communities. They both use technology. And I'll talk a little bit about how we designed them and, and how you would design for online social learning communities. Um, so the first one is learning creative learning. Uh, it's not your usual online course. And uh, it came about when I first started working at the Media Lab. Uh, this has been my main collaborator, Mitchell Resnick, and I'll talk about him in a, a little more in a second. Um, but uh, Mitch and I, st the, the MOOCs, a lot of people were talking about MOOCs, massive open online courses, and there was a lot of excitement about MOOCs, and Mitch and I were not so uh, interested in MOOCs, or not so, we, we felt like they were doing some things really well, like making content available to many people, uh, and producing more content, we thought those were good things, but there were aspects of learning that we really cared about that we didn't see represented in MOOCs. And so, in true Media Lab style, instead of writing a critical article about MOOCs, we decided we were going to tinker with very large online courses. I'd done a lot of work with smaller online courses, he'd done a lot of work teaching at the Media Lab, and so we brought those two aspects together and we decided, well, how does this, happen? How does this work if you scale it up? And so, we scaled it up uh, to 25,000 people, so we had a fairly large community of people signing up. And we used the Media Lab, the formal course that exists at the Media Lab, as kind of our backbone, as our starting point. And then we made changes to that, because some things don't work online, and some things um, you have to change a little bit. And one of the things that's very different when you think about an online community compared to a course, your role changes, right? In a course, you are much more in control. You, 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 you define a lot more about what happens for each individual student, each week, you test things. There's kind of a m generally a more rigid structure. At the Media Lab, it's a little bit different, but it, once you have a community the size of 25,000 people and you want creative learning to happen, there's no way you could even try this. So your role becomes much more the role of a host. So you're hosting a large party, essentially, right? You get to, de you get to decide what music uh, is going to be played, at least initially, until someone comes and, and they take away the remote control. Um, maybe you can prepare some snacks or some topics that people can talk about. Uh, you, you may have some ideas about who should be sitting with whom, where you think they, they have things in common. But then, you know, 25,000 people show up and you have to be comfortable to let go. You have to create ways for those people to start changing what happens and uh, making this an experience that they want to have. And y then you become more of a, you can model certain behaviors, you can set certain examples. But there's a, there's a way of kind of co-creating that, that has to happen. And so we did this very intentionally. We invited everyone who showed up to create this course with us. We said, we don't know how to do this for 25,000 people. We would love to get you involved and not just tell us how to do it, but feel free to do it yourself. And so this is an interesting picture to me because um, it, it's, it looks very common. It's a map of the people in the course, right? Every online course has these maps. But we didn't come up with the idea and we didn't make the map. So in the first week, Adriano Paracciani from Italy, he sent a, a message on the discussion forum. He said, I, I would love to have a map. Can you please make a map for the course? Um, and everyone can put their pin in it. And we wrote back and we said, that's a really fantastic idea, but we don't um, want to make the map, we want you to make the map. And so Adriano made the map, he created it in Google Maps, he wrote a little how-to, he became the steward of the map, people asked him questions, my, my pin has disappeared. Um, and these are by far not all the people, but there are, in Google Maps there was a limitation where I think after a few hundred people you had to make another map, and so there are dozens of maps. And Adriano really became the, the map guy, and he's still involved two years later. There's a community now, he's, he's famous in the community, uh, and, and that was how he started. Um, and it was an idea that also is particularly important for community, which we realized later, because seeing the visual re representation of the other people who are somewhere with you actually uh, creates a much stronger sense of community than having an abstract list of names, right? So if you have a thousand names in a long list, it doesn't feel very personal. But if you can see the pin on a map at least, you can start imagining there's a person there and it, it creates a stronger sense of community. And so we've tried to do that in, in all aspects of the course. Um, we created um, activities every week 
that would let the people explore the things they were interested in. So we wanted them to feel like they, they were in control of this course and we were giving them some activities and then they could do those with other people, their families or people they wanted to work with. And then every week there was a very strong aspect of sharing back what they had done. And a lot of the activities were offline. So the first one, this is the Marshmallow Challenge, which if you don't know the Marshmallow Challenge, I, would, I highly recommend you Google it and you do it. It's really amazing. It's an amazing learning experience and um, I won't give away... <laughs> There, there are some groups of people who are really good at it, and there are some groups of people who are really bad at it. Um, management consultants are really bad at it. <laughs> um, and uh, in some weeks, we did online activities. Scratch was mentioned before. It's a programming environment for kids, but you can use it to create stories, to create games, to create greeting cards. And also, it's the kind of environment where if you're a very advanced programmer, you can use it to do very complex things. And if you're a beginner, you can do it to do very simple things. And so we designed activities that we, th we, we thought would let the community feel engaged in the course rather than recipients of knowledge. One other thing we did was live events, which was very unusual. So every week we ran a live event. Uh, we did a seminar, we had conversations, uh, we had a, a big group of people show up in a chat, and we even did breakout rooms. So we wanted people to talk to each other, we wanted them to feel like they're part of, there are all these people showing up at the same time, and there's something really qualitatively different when you come to the space online or offline at the same time each week and there's a sense of community that develops. People would recognize each other, they would always introduce themselves in the beginning. Hey, I'm from Rome, I'm from Barcelona. Um, and and it's, it was just nice to see th the people come together in that way. And we created a discussion forum, we gave them some other tools that are more obvious um, and we let people create lots of other groups. So in the end there were 450 individual discussion groups run by people from the community about things that they were interested in. We, we hadn't pre-created all of those. We couldn't imagine what all those things would be that they were interested in, but we totally supported it and we thought it was great. And some of them were offline, right? So not everything happened online. Uh, you don't have to have an online course that's just online. I think an online course that has offline components uh, brings a, a whole different quality to a lot of the learning. Can I check the time? Because my timer is a little off. Uh, 24 past 7, 7.4. Okay, yeah, so um, still 10, 10 minutes. minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, and I would have said perfect even if it wasn't. But uh <laughs> 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 um, So, yeah, so learning creative learning, w which started as, as a more of a course, really grew into a community, and we've run it twice as a course. So with kind of a start and end date, but all the materials are always available. You don't have to show up at a certain time to get to the materials or to join the discussion forum. Um, but we found that people find it helpful if they can sign up for something and they can do it with other people. And so we've just launched a new model where we're hoping that c the community itself will start running the course. So when a thousand people sign up, we put them into a cohort and we kick off a round of emails where it kind of suggest certain things that they could do each week alongside with all the other people who are already there. Um, and so far, I'd say mixed successes. Uh, the first week was really good, the second week was very slow. And um, we're, we're already thinking about, could we have more language-specific communities or country-specific communities? Because it's really important that there are some people involved who feel passionately about the, the subject, but also who want to invest in building community. Uh, and we can't do that for the whole world. Like we, we're hoping that other people will come in with us. Um, and we've written a report, uh, Mitchell, I mentioned him before, Natalie Rusk and myself, about this experience at reports.p2pu.org. Um, it's, everything is open access, of course, so if you want to, it's a very friendly report, it's not very academic, uh, but it summarizes some of those design ideas and decisions. And so my second example that I want to talk about a little bit for online uh, social learning communities uh, is called EdCamp. And when learning creative learning is not your typical online course, then EdCamp is not your typical conference. Uh, it's an unconference for educators run by educators. And there have been over 550 EdCamps by now in dozens of countries. I've just checked today, there hasn't been one in Spain. So I think that would be 
maybe a nice project for someone who's interested in getting involved in this space. Um, it's a really great community around the world of uh, educators who organize these events where other educators can, can come and they talk about the things that they're interested in. Um, and so I mentioned there are unconferences, and I should probably uh, say one word about what is an unconference. D well, maybe who knows what an unconference is or a bar camp? Okay, so just a few arms. Um, so essentially, an unconference is a conference that's run by the participants. So generally, you, you set a date or a time, everyone shows up at that, at that moment, and the first session is that anyone who wants to host a workshop or host a, a presentation or host a panel can raise their hand, get on stage, and they can say, oh, what have we got here? For example, I can't read any of these, but what is that, enterprise micro something? So th if I am the expert or I'm really interested or I have a problem with this micro enterprise something topic, I get up on stage, I say, I really want to talk about this topic. I can present a little bit about my work, but I want to have a discussion. And then, you know, a few people raise their hand to indicate that they may be interested. And then you use kind of a, a time grid and a room grid and you create the conference on the fly. And people have been doing this for many years in different formats, and they work really, really well. Uh, people generally feel more engaged, feel more excited. Uh, it's much easier to be at an unconference than to be at a conference where you're generally sitting a lot, listening. At an unconference, you get to talk, you get to uh, ask questions, you're in smaller groups. Um, so it, it's a really great model, and it works very well in the, in the physical world. Um, and uh, it, it, it doesn't really work so well in the online world yet, at least it didn't. And so we set out to change that um, and uh, talked to EdCamp and said, would you be interested in trying to do an EdCamp online? And they said, yeah, that would be great because not everyone can come to these events and uh, we would like to experiment with this online. And so we built a tool, I don't know if this will play, but um, we bit built a tool called Unhangout that leverages Google Hangouts um, and most of this is actually pretty straightforward. There's a live video at the top where you can, you, know, you can have presenters speaking or you can embed videos. There's a chat room where people can chat in the lobby. Uh, there's a list of people that you can see who's there, you can see their names. And then the interesting thing really is this. There's an unlimited number of breakout groups. So while the event is happening, we can create more breakout groups and we can, you know, t we can give them names and we can use the feedback from the community to create those groups, right? So if the community says, I really want to have a breakout group on the color red, we create a breakout room for the color red. And then there's someone who wants to talk about blue, we make one for blue, purple, you know, we can spin them up while the event is happening. And because we're using Google Hangout for all the hard work, there's, it's really easy for us to do, because in terms of technology, none of the, the heavy load ends up on our um, system. And so this is a picture of the actual uh, EdCamp online and this is Kristen Swanson who's one of the founders of EdCamp and who is just a terrific educator and innovator and she's giving a kind of an introduction you can see these are some of the sessions educator professional development one educator professional development two 20% of your time uh, which I think is uh, the topic is uh, can you create kind of an innovation culture in schools where teachers can spend 20% of their time working on projects that they're interested in but all of these were suggested by the people, so there were 117 people, by those people who showed up for the event. And then they would break into these rooms, and you can see here, we, so we had 117 people and one cat. I don't know if you can <laughs> see the cat on the screen. <laughs> but, um, and then people have conversations about the topics that, that they're most interested in. And so what are some of the benefits of these, these virtual ad camps? Because ad camps in the face-to-face -face world work really well. What does the online add to it? Well, it adds distribution. So two online events we've done so far and 15 face-to-face events have been a result of this. So people would come to the online event, they would get a sense of what this community feels like, and then they would say, I'm going to do a face-to-face -face ad camp in my community where maybe nobody has done an ad camp yet. Professional development for teachers. I don't know exactly what the situation is in Spain, but in, in the US, teachers have to continuously get professional uh, certification. So while they're teachers, they have to go to workshops, they have to take classes. Um, and a lot of it is very 
kind of, um, let's say, traditional, right? So uh, it's, it's not of always super high quality. It's not always about the latest topics. Uh, some of it is kind of lagging behind a little bit, whereas ad camps are kind of at the cutting edge of what teachers want to do in the classroom today. Like, here's an experiment I did with my class. I want to share it with you. Um, and so, not surprisingly, 86% of the, part of the uh, respondents um, said that this was a good alternative to traditional professional development. Recruitment, 48% uh, of the um, event had never been to in an ad camp. So for ad camp, this is a great way of pulling in new people and growing their, their community. And engagement, 55% of the people created or voted on a session. So if you compare this to a normal conference where usually right, you see the program, you arrive in the morning, and then you go to the s each session that you're interested in, but you don't, maybe you get to raise your hand and ask a question. But that's really the extent to how engaged people generally are. Here, in this event, 55% of the people took an active role. Either they said, I want to go to this session, this should happen, or they created a session. So it's a different kind of um, engagement. And surprisingly, you know, some of these things work really well online um, and maybe sometimes better than offline. So are open social learning communities the future of education? I think so. I hope I've made a little bit of a case uh, why I think so. Um, I want to connect two ideas that I mentioned before because I think that's very important. One is I talked about peer learning and how in the Harvard assessment study they found that the ability to join study groups or, or form new study groups was the most important factor for being a successful Harvard student. Now, if you, th if you forget about Harvard, which is a few thousand students, and you think of the internet with millions, hundreds of millions of people, then the power that that skill gives you becomes much larger. So if you are a learner who's able to go out into the internet, find other people that you can learn with, that help you, that is a huge advantage over someone who does not have that skill. So this kind of becoming a better learner, developing 21st century skills, is now uh, not only is a very good thing, but also is a very important thing for everyone to develop. And then I want to end on this uh, quote, which I think is great. When we talked about the future of education today, uh, Alan Kay said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so uh, I am trying to invent a future that uh, is built around social learning communities online, but that should not be the only future. And I think all of you are inventors in some form, and many of you will be uh, interested in education and learning. And so I hope that um, you will uh, predict the future of education uh, by inventing it um, with me. We have these advanced ideas about learning, and yet we have such low results in the PISA study. So there are many reasons for this. One is the ideas that I just presented now are not the reality in U.S. schools. I in effect, U.S. schools are going the exact opposite way. And uh, one of the reasons why the Media Lab started this effort, uh, which I didn't talk very much about, but Learning Over Education is an, is an initiative at the Media Lab that combines three research groups, which is unusual. Usually the groups stick to themselves. Um, and one of the reasons why we're doing this is exactly for this reason, that the, the examples for a different kind of learning in the US are missing right now. And so the whole field is moving towards standardized testing, um, aligned curricula, uh, treating everyone the same, still within the grade, so keeping all the structure and adding more to it, and then even introducing standardized testing to the kindergarten now. So um, the exact opposite of what we are promoting. So I, uh, I hope that if something like this becomes more widespread, the PISA results will also go up at the same time, I'm also a little nervous about the PISA results because whenever you measure certain things, it drives policy, it drives activity. And, and I, I heard Passy Salberg, uh, the Finnish, um, he wrote a book called Finnish Lessons about the Finnish school system. He, he said something very interesting. He said, Finland was moving away from the Finnish system that they're so famous for now when the first PISA study came out and they scored at the top and it saved their school system because they were trying to change it and become more like the rest of Europe and the US 
uh, with accountability and more standardization. And so PISA saved them. Uh, and then they became very proud of this model and they, you know, they, they stuck to it. But so I'm a little worried about PISA as the overall measurement for learning and education. I think we have to be careful with that. Um, but why does the US uh, uh, rank low? And also actually why does the US have a terrible education system? Is because uh, low investment in public education and a, a push towards standardization and assessment and testing. Um, so I think a lot of things in the US are a, a big problem. Um, X MOOCs versus C MOOCs. I totally agree. C MOOCs are the interesting ones. Um, um, and so, for those of you who may not be totally familiar with the distinction, X MOOCs are kind of the MOOCs that became famous, that were in the New York Times, where uh, coming out of Stanford, where you had 100,000 people sign up. It was usually video lectures, and then it was self assessment. So, you would do uh, uh, automated assessments, you would solve a problem, submit your answer, and a computer would, would say yes or no. Um, and CMOOCs were much more communities, more in line with what I talked about, where people would group around a, a common interest, but then there would be no platform, people would use Twitter and their own blogs and email, and there, the conversation would be distributed all over the web. And it was, it's very messy, it's very hard to follow, there's very little structure. Um, so. How do you scale that? Uh, I don't think anyone has really figured out how to scale the, the pure CMOOC. And I think when you start scaling, you have to compromise between the two. You have to create more uh, clear, may maybe more clarity around certain aspects. And I think one piece that is very helpful is to have some common technologies. So while people should still be able to use all of their tools that they want to use, um, in our course, and also I should add, in our course, we used only open source software except Google Hangouts uh, and in the first one, Google Community, Google Plus Communities. But we used only open source software or hosted software. So we, paid, we didn't pay for software. Um, it was software that's off the shelf available to anyone. So it wasn't like we, we built this incredibly sophisticated platform that you know, that's why it worked so well. It was, we used kind of the, the, the most basic tools. But we did stick to a few tools for like, you know, we didn't say use anything you want. And I think that was very helpful for people. And I think that's where a lot of people in the CMOOCs get lost. Um, so I think sticking to a few tools, good moderation, uh, having some kind of check-in points. Um, so there was a question about MIT leading the revolution on how to learn. Um, so I have to be very careful here. I work for the Media Lab, which is an institute at MIT. MIT does a lot of things that look very different from this. And um, you know, we like each other very well, but I can't speak on behalf of MIT at all. Uh, and um, MIT also does a lot of things that don't look like this, like MOOCs, right? MIT is one of the major MOOC providers. Uh, they've developed edX. Um, and uh, I think the people who are run leading the project at MIT itself are excellent people. I think they have a lot of good ideas about how to uh, change and improve education at MIT. Um, but what we are doing is, I guess, kind of a little bit outside of the norm more than what the, the other people at MIT are doing. And then there was a specific question about how does this example influence schools? And that's a very important question. Um, so, so we're doing some things, but I, I think you asked the question, right? Um, uh, so Learning Creative Learning essentially was a course for educators. And it was, it was kind of the, the back door into schools, right? Instead of going through the districts in the US, everything is by district, um, or the principals, we said, let's find the teachers who are excited, help them, and then we'll infiltrate, infiltrate the schools. So that's one, building a community of people who are excited about these ideas, who are in schools. Uh, Scratch is another example, where Scratch doesn't, isn't, Scratch's strategy so far has been to be out, out of school. So people use it at home, in the library, in after school programs. Some schools are starting to use it, but generally the better schools. And so the question now is how do we get Scratch into the school so that every kid can use it? Um, and uh, there are two, two ideas. One is Scratch Ed, which is an educator community, again, using the educators who want to do this and supporting them. And the other one is uh, creating curricula that makes it easier for teachers to take Scratch and apply it in the classroom. So we are thinking about those things. And then there's one project I didn't talk about is there's a faculty member at the Media Lab who is uh, designing a new type of Montessori school. So he's not trying to get this into schools, he's starting new schools. Uh, and he has 
nine schools already. Uh, they're very small. They're micro schools. They, have, um, they will never have more than 18 kids per school, two teachers and 18 kids. Uh, they run out of storefronts, so you could uh, store closes, you rent the store, you put a school in it. Um, and uh, they're grow he's growing very quickly right now, there's a lot of interest, and so his strategy is to read, why don't we just build new schools, um, which I think is, is also interesting. And then um, uh, the question about group work is excellent. Uh, and so there are lots of reasons why we know now why groups don't work. Right? Uh, and, and actually, sometimes groups are terrible because they have something called groupthink, where it's almost like when the group starts getting an idea, even if it's the wrong idea, uh, the person with the right idea can't influence the group anymore because everyone wants to believe that the, that idea is what should, what should be done. Um, but um, I don't agree with your solution. So I think there's a slightly different solution. You said there needs to be a leader. And I would just... So I don't... I agree with that almost all, uh, 100%. The twist I would make is there needs to be leadership, but it doesn't have to be a leader. It could be someone who we would consider more of a facilitator. So someone who isn't telling everyone what to do, but just makes sure everyone gets to speak and kind of points out where the group may be having difficulties. And this is exactly um, the challenge we ran into with peer-to-peer -peer university when we first tried this that some groups worked really well if they had these natural facilitators. And one interesting thing that we found is it was often people who were not experts in the content who were better facilitators because they focused on process. Right? They focused on the relationships. They wanted to make sure everyone has a good time, whereas people who are experts on content often get distracted by what's the right answer and are we covering all the important points. Um, so I think the solution is helping people become better facilitators in these online communities. And, and at Learning Creative Learning, we tried, to, uh, we tried uh, to model what it means to be a good facilitator as much as we could. So all the conversations we're, uh, we're having in groups are open, so you can see how we're dealing with groups. Um, when we see groups producing things, you know, we always kind of, we try to encourage uh, good behavior in a way. Uh, um, so. It's, yeah, I, I think there's, a, it's, there's not like one perfect solution or, or uh, answer to this, but uh, you're absolutely right that uh, to make groups work, uh, facilitation uh, or, or other aspects of, of uh, the group fabric that holds together are really important. A lot of this online learning uh, work uh, attracts people who already have degrees, where you, it's, it's for people who want to learn more, who want to spend their time spend in these projects, but who already have a degree. And we haven't really cracked the, the next level where people who also want to do these things, but and actually the WOC is, is a, probably a, a good example for someone, you know, an organization that has a lot of experience in this space, but re really at massive scale, cracking this next uh, community where people want to learn in these new ways, want to be experimental, but they also need certification or some form of recognition so that they can get a better job or you know, they can get a, a higher salary or they can get a job in the first place. So I think it's a combination of a number of things. One is, um, and these are observations that, uh, that I, I've had in the last few years and I, I think somehow this comes together. One is, if you go to any community uh, and you ask the people who is the expert for a particular aspect? Even if you go to a second uh, uh, grade, well, maybe, maybe a seventh grade math class, and you ask the students, who is the expert in algebra? They all know. So there's something in communities where communities are extremely good at figuring out who is good at what. And we haven't found ways to use technology to make that easier. So I think that's an area using peer assessment, peer reviews, who do you listen to, who are you interacting with, who do you go to ask a question. All those things can be tracked now. And just surfacing uh, expertise out of communities, I think, is, is a very exciting space. Um, the second one is portfolios. So students at the Media Lab all get a degree at the end. We only have masters and PhD students. They all get a piece of paper at the end. But really what they leave with is a portfolio of projects and a network of people. So the piece of paper is almost meaningless. It's, you know, so we have a degree called Media Arts and Sciences. 
I have never seen a job description that said, we're looking for media arts and sciences graduates. Right? So we basically educate people to be unemployable. But what they leave with is these projects that they've built, which are often very interdisciplinary and involve very advanced technologies, and they can show these projects. And so if we can find opportunities for students when they're learning things to create projects that they are proud of, and we make it easier to, to see those projects, then that could also be a form of, of recognition. And then, and then the last one, I think there's a big problem with the monopoly on certification in most countries. And it was put in place for the right, all the right reasons, right? Like quality. You want to make sure that it's meaningful if you go to university and you get the piece of paper. You haven't wasted your time. You want to make sure if you're an employer and you look at the piece of paper that you can trust the piece of paper. So all the intentions behind it are really, really good. But we've come to this position now where we don't allow anyone to, to compete, right? Like it's either you're an accredited university or you're not. And all these other certificates are kind of second class or it takes a long time to establish them in the market or they're, they're, you know, corporations seem to be better actually than others to establish them. And I think it would be great to add many more certifications. So let's not get rid of the university degrees. I think university degrees are great aggregate uh, signals for an experience. Um, but why don't we add many more and, and letting other people add more certificates and then letting kind of the market, to some, and I mean the market in the best possible way, not in the American way, um, letting the market decide. You know, if the, the MACPA in Barcelona uh, gives digital badges for people who have you know, studied Catalan art, for example, and over time those badges are respected by other people, then that's great, right? Like building an ecosystem where more people can create those micro credentials, I think would be very interesting and would actually help a lot of people who have uh, experiences that fall outside of the more formal traditional education system. So that's where digital badges come in. And mm -hmm. it's very unclear where this field will go. Uh, there's been a lot of work done already. And as we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, LinkedIn is a very interesting organization in this space where you know, it's not, um, uh, it's not completely un infeasible, unfeasible that LinkedIn will become the global certification authority for all of your credentials, which for I would be a little nervous about if I was a university. Well, I work for a university, but if I was a university, I'd be a little nervous about this. But um, in many ways, it could also be an opportunity to allow new kinds of certificates. But players like LinkedIn, or, or similar systems, I think, will play a much bigger role in this space. Uh, some things are really hard to teach, but they are much easier to learn. Or, or maybe even some things can be learned, but they can't be taught. And so a lot of these soft skills, I feel, fall into that category, where if you create a context where people can explore or, or experience them, they're, they're not hard to learn. But if someone doesn't have them and you're trying to teach them you, and you're saying be more proactive or be more curious, it, it, it's impossible. And so, um, well, one thing, with, and, and also the other thing is uh, it's really difficult to do online, right? especially if it's not live video. You can't see the person. It's really difficult to get a sense of why are they not responding? Is it because they think it's a boring conversation? Is it because they're too shy? Is it, you know, are they even there still? I, I don't know. Um, so uh, using tools that are more live and synchronous for the online part. But then the other one is um, uh, we, we're doing one project now where we've started uh, or we, we are about to start study groups in public libraries in Chicago because especially for people who are struggling with this online world who don't have the soft skills, who maybe have the motivation, like they want to do something but they don't know exactly how and uh, they are likely to drop out uh, if they take an online course. Having a study group that meets face-to-face, -face, we think, is very important. And so it's going to be an experiment where we're hoping to bring together people face-to-face. -to -face. And I think in those contexts, it's much easier to, first of all, get better at collaborating with other people, but also developing kind of self-confidence and, and you know, some of the aspects that you need to get to the soft skills. Um, and then the, the, the last thing, and I'm not an expert on this, but it, it reminded me of the story that I read about the um, indus industrial model in Japan, where the car, also the car manufacturers changed the assembly lines and they created these little units of people who were in full control 
of their part of the assembly line. Like anyone in the factory could stop the assembly line at any moment. And they were allowed to move the tools and design their piece however they thought was the best way. And um, it increased both engagement and motivation and productivity. And workers became more motivated because they felt like they had some, some ownership of, over the process. So it's this weird chicken and egg problem where on one hand, you're like, well, we can't give them more uh, ownership because they're not ready. On the other hand, they'll never be ready if you don't give them more ownership. So um, it's, I think it's really hard. I think it's a really hard problem. Um, and then cross-cultural, so I think there are huge differences. Uh, I am not an expert on this, but um, uh, I mean, co the very simple basic ones, communication, language, uh, familiarity with technology, uh, access to technology, like there are so many uh, just, you know, just input factors that aren't even getting to the more interesting subtle differences and in how people, you know, why people learn, how they would ask questions, how they, how they I mean, another one is how, they, how do you deal with authority? Uh, it's a very cultural um, characteristic and it completely changes how you learn and how you might want to learn. I still think that the four P's are a good way to learn in any culture but I think they lend themselves more naturally to certain cultures that are where young people are used to uh, challenging authority, for example. Uh, cultures where young people are taught. So I lived in South Africa for 11 years before moving to Boston. And I was born in Germany. My dad was born in Hungary. My mom was born in Poland. Right? So it's like, oh, and I just broke the chair. Um, uh, uh, I hope that's not on the video. Um, uh, uh, so there is a little bit of cross-cultural background, um, and I, I lost my train of thought now, but uh, um, so I think it's, a, it's an area that, that needs to be explored more. In South Africa, um, the, this idea of asking questions to, to the elders is very discouraged, and so you know, creating these kind of learning communities in a culture where asking questions is discouraged is much harder. But young people pick up things very quickly. Right? And so if you create an, an environment where other young people ask questions, I think they'll pick it up. They'll want to ask questions. But, uh, and also, I don't think everyone should learn the same way. I don't think everyone should be the same way. I think we should all be different and in in learn in different ways. And that's much more interesting. But uh, there are no systems right now that would you know, support all kinds of different styles of learning um, in, in some way. Um, I think we're still at the end of the first generation, right? And so when you think about the, like a fundamental new technology, first generation is always difficult. And so we should now start to see really interesting experiments, in my opinion. So we're kind of at the beginning, what I, ho what I hope will be bigger changes. But then what you were talking about, I think, is really culture change, right? It's not so much technology change or just the schools. It's really a different understanding of why are we learning? How are we learning? What role plays technology? What role do parents play? What role does the university play? And f for me, I, I would describe that almost like a, a new culture of learning. Um, and we're doing some things to, to support that process. So one is um, the people need to... So telling the story of learning in new ways, I think is really important. And so we have a, this How MIT Learns project is essentially a storytelling project. And we're gonna create animated uh, movies that talk about how students learn at MIT that's very unexpected, but it's very playful and it kind of, it gives you a sense of the feeling of this learning, but we're finding new ways of telling that story so people can experience it. Right, so it's clear if we write another report or an article and we publish it and you know, not nine people read it, it's not going to change the culture of learning. If we create an animated movie that maybe a million parents watch and then they talk to their... Like, so I think different kinds of storytelling are really in interesting. Different kinds of academic storytelling. Um, I, do, you know, I, I have a technology background and I still think that in some cases, technology can enable social practices where people do things differently because they can now that is much stronger than anything you could regulate or suggest or, 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 or and I, have a, I only have a negative example, but you know, essentially when file sharing uh, uh, happened, sharing music was illegal and everyone did it. Right? Like everyone started sharing digital files because we could. And 
you know, by the time that it took the law so long to catch up. And, and also, it's, it wasn't that we wanted to break the law, it was that we wanted to share music. And the moment you could do it legally and pay for it, most people were very happy to pay for it and do it legally. But so my, my point is just like sometimes you can come up with technologies that are so compelling that let people do things in new ways that maybe there's kind of this wave of users that will change you know, behavior. So I think Scratch is an example for that. If we can get you know, millions of kids using Scratch today, they'll demand different teaching when they, when they get to seventh grade. Um, and then the last one is it is a generational issue also. So you know, there's, some, there's some level of innovation, you know, one retirement at a time, uh, where it takes time for people to leave the system and new people to come into the system who are going to be in decision making, you know, have decision making powers, who, you know, have grown up with the internet, they'll imagine a future that that is different from the future that someone else imagines. And so, I think having more people there, and, and I'm not I'm not uh, suggesting at all that the older generation is a problem in this process. I think absolutely not. I think they have experience that needs to be very important in, in this entire conversation. But it's very difficult even for people kind of at a, at a very senior level to make these big decisions because uh, if they don't have enough support uh, in, in, their, in their companies or in their, in their organizations, and that support comes with time, right? As more young people come into the, into the kind of lower positions or you know, junior faculty or students, you know, the university can do things that the students will approve that would be very difficult to do 10 years ago or um, so I think it's, it's, you know, some of this just, unfortunately, the, the, we, we don't work at the, at the speed of the internet. 